What if the trees built up resistance and just stop growing? Or the rivers formed a front line and just stop flowing? There's no amount of intellect that justifies lack of respect. The power on this planet, man, it's time for us to redirect. What we took for granted to face an underhand, it won't get us to tomorrow for much more than you can stand. Visiting has always been important to indigenous peoples. Through visiting, we share stories, strengthen kinship, and learn from one another. It allows us to build and maintain respectful relationships in a way that uplifts Indigenous ways of being, doing, and knowing. I'm Matt Dunn, Senior Strategic Officer, Indigenous Engagement at the University of Saskatchewan. Today, we're honoured to be meeting on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis in the hopes of learning more about the research going on here, sharing stories, and honouring and appreciating our interconnectedness. Dr. Heather Folds, Assistant Professor and Kinesiologist at the University of Saskatchewan, the Heart and Stroke CIHR Indigenous Early Career Women's Heart and Brain Health Chair, traces her Métis ancestry to the Red River settlements before the first resistance, and then to Brisailer and Langmead, Saskatchewan. Her research spans the fields of Indigenous health, cardiovascular physiology, and exercise physiology, and is supported by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, and Canada's Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Thanks for joining us. So welcome, Heather. Thank you for joining us today for the visiting video series. Mm -hmm. uh, looking forward to chatting more about your research, your personal background. Tell me about your research. How did you end up studying what you study? My story is a bit of a winding path. I started in my undergrad doing biochemistry, thinking I would head to either medicine or physio. And uh, so after I finished that at, at the smaller University of Northern British Columbia, I had to switch to the college to take anatomy and physiology, which were prerequisites, and uh, did some kinesiology classes there and, and did some job shadowing with uh, physiotherapists and thought uh, I'll consider doing a master's in kinesiology as kind of an, another option. and. Um, so in the end, I went to that program. I, I went into a lab at uh, the University of British Columbia, and they had a program going on with Indigenous communities around the province doing a walking and running program. And uh, so as the Indigenous student, I was kind of naturally fit in there, and that was my, my master's project, and kind of headed in that direction ever since. And why does community and culture have such a major role, in, uh, major role to play in health, especially with Indigenous peoples? Well, I think that from an Indigenous worldview that's kind of a uh, given that the community is a big part of your wellness and your culture is a big part of your who you are and your, your connection and, and that they're all linked together and um, I mean the medicine wheel that we see is always the kind of staple illustration of how those things are all tied together and influence your health. Um, it's not really recognized the same way in Western medicine and um, so that was some of the, the work that came out of my master's was, or sorry, my PhD was that um, being connected to your culture was uh, associated with different risks for hypertension. So that direct kind of medical link and that my program is, the research now is kind of built off of that, the connection with culture and community and how it affects your health. When I started here at the OVS, I was new to the province and didn't have all of the community connections and relationships. And, and I knew that was gonna take time to, to build. So I started doing, um, a, a study with middle-aged women and, and not specific to any indigenous um, or any, indi any ethnic group. And one of the participants who signed up to come emailed me and she said, well, yeah, I'm, I fit your criteria, I'll come and uh, do your study, but I'm also a Folds and I think we're maybe related, so let's meet and connect with that. So, um, so Susan Folds has come and, and she was doing Métis dancing. She said, oh, this is fun, you should come and do it with us. So I started coming with my family and dancing and um, and we've been dancing probably for five years. And then a couple of years ago, we started talking about, well, we could do some research and make this, uh, look more at this and, and gather more of our, our stories that way. Yeah, so it sounds like it started in a really organic way. Yeah. And, and through that connection with family. Yeah. so important. Yeah. So how, when it comes to Métis dancing, how do you study, how do you study that? The initial study was with Red River Jigging. Um, and a study funded by the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation. And I had experienced dancers come into the lab and do uh, a VO2 max test to get their fitness level. And then they came back and did the Red River Jig with the, the VO2 card on to measure their oxygen and getting a sense of how intense this exercise is and how, um, how many steps you're taking when you're dancing. And then uh, switch gears a bit. So while we've been 
uh, isolating and we're doing remote interviews with people to ask questions about how their experiences dancing are connected to their health and their well-being and how it compares to other types of exercise they do and getting that more qualitative aspect and uh, so the, the grants I have coming up that we're just starting now will also expand into looking at the what are the stories and the symbolism that are embedded in dancing and how is it important for our community and and has that changed over the past 150 years and um, kind of all of those aspects of dance. I love that there's both a, the qualitative aspects of, of the stories and uh, the quantitative um, um, aspect of the, the study as well. For those that may not know, can you explain what a VO2 max test is and, and what, it, what it measures? Well, the way I explain it to my kids is you're wearing kind of a Darth Vader mask. You put the mask over your face and it's hooked up to a computer that, and it's measuring what your the air you're breathing in and the air you're breathing out, how much oxygen there is in each of the components, and then we can measure how much oxygen you're using when you're breathing um, by, how, by the difference between um, inhaling and exhaling. We're in your lab today. What can you tell me about the lab and the experiment we'll be running through? Yeah, so today is uh, Red River Jigging. So we have a participant who came in last week and did a VO2 max test. I'm gonna come in today down to the to this lab and he's gonna dance for us on the, the plywood here for up to 10 minutes of Red River Jigging. Hello, my name's uh, Kurt Adamogan. I'm a fourth year student. I am Métis from Pine House Lakes, Saskatchewan, Shady 10 and I am a Neo, so I speak Cree. Kurt is um, one of our participants who's been uh, volunteered to come and dance for us today. He'll have a face mask on to measure his oxygen, and we'll get, get to measure how intense he's exercising, how the river jigging compares to other types of exercise. He's got some motion capture sensors on him so we can count the steps and the motion and the movement, looking at the motion capture system and how many steps he's taking while he's doing that kind of dance. What has your data been saying? Um, what and how much of an effect on health does it have? From a physical activity perspective, I think Red River Jigging is a pretty high intensity, probably up 85% of maximum, which is pushing pretty high intensity mm -hmm. levels. And then the qualitative interviews so far have been really um, amazing. The, the people have some really amazing stories about how their connections and their experiences dancing and how it's connected to, to their health and in such an important part of their well-being. Um, and, and as I think you would expect, the connection of community and the social aspects that tie in as well. Yeah, yeah. So not just the, yeah, the cardiovascular health, but those other components as well. Yeah. Well, with that being said, uh, it sounds like it's it's great for overall health. Should more people be doing uh, Métis jigging? Yeah, our, our community group is not just Métis people. We have people of all kinds of cultures who come and join us and, and learn the dancing and uh, it's you know, a welcoming place that, that people could do. Um, Scott Duffy is one of the jigging instructors who's been a big part of this, this research with me. And one of his dreams is to have everyone do the Red River Jig that is kind of, a, in the origins of the dance, kind of combine different, different pieces from different cultures. So it's a, it's a very, uh, like a bringing community together. So you're also studying the health impacts of Indian residential schools on First Nation survivors and the foster care system on Métis people. What are you learning from those studies? One of the first studies I did with Indigenous communities here in, in Saskatchewan, we did a survey of physical activity levels and social support, cultural connectedness, and some questions about whether you or your family had been in residential school or foster care, and trying to identify if there are certain aspects of our culture and social experiences that might influence how physically active we are. And, uh, and th so those were some of the findings that for First Nations people who have been in residential school or had family members in residential school that, um, that they might be more physically active and uh, that foster care is influencing Métis experiences. Some of the initial ideas is that uh, physical activity might be a, a tool for resilience and a way of kind of coping with the experiences of those, those uh, traumas. And uh, if I think of some of the stories that elders have shared with me, I think that there's probably some, um, some truth to physical activity as a, a survival tool in a way of, of dealing with what you're experiencing. I have a research chair position funded by uh, the CIHR and the Heart and Stroke Foundation to look at how culture and social support are connected to uh, health, uh, cardiovascular health measures um, and especially looking at Indigenous women's experience and how that might be different from men's. The, um, the qualitative interviews so far have talked a lot about the uh, finding the connections to land and even in the city finding places and spaces where you can be on the land, the different food preservation methods that 
we use um, subsistence methods, uh, community, and, um, and, and lots of talk, especially from uh, younger Indigenous people about the, um, the racism and, and when it's safe to, d to identify as Indigenous, and especially for Métis um, people that you may kind of be walking in both worlds, and is it safe for me to identify as Métis now, or is it, um, is it the place to just pass as white? And has that changed for you over the years as um, more people start talking about the complexities of Indigenous identity as indigenization and reconciliation um, become more commonplace as terms that people are used to talking about? Um, has that, have you noticed a change in those areas? Well, to a certain extent, I mean, my personal story, I, I, I remember being eight years old at my grandparents' house and my grandfather um, you know, sat us down and said, we're, we're Métis and we need to to join the nation and, and it's time. But he, um, because of you know the past experiences, their family denied that they were Métis and, um, until my great-grandmother died and then it was kind of, okay, we can, we can acknowledge it now. It depends where you are and, and it depends where your family's at. Some families are ready to acknowledge and, and you know, mine was how many decades ago that we, we did that, but not everyone's family is at that point. Unfortunately, it's still all too common of a story, people. Um, not recognizing that identity because of the oppression that they faced, because of the potential yeah. harms that they've had to endure. We know that community and family is, is so important in shaping who we are. Um, where did you grow up and where are you from? Where's your family from? My um, Métis family originally was in the Red River. Um, the Folds actually had their homestead was on Lipton Street. And um, then of course after the, the first resistance we had to move out. Um, and uh, moved to this, the Sayre side, Bremner side, moved to Brasailer and across the river the folds were in Langmead, um, which is just along the highway a couple hours west uh, of Saskatoon heading towards Edmonton. And um, family lived there until the, after World War II, then my grandfather and my grandparents moved out to BC, Coquitlam, and um, my parents moved before I was born up to Prince George, BC. So I grew up in Prince George, um, where my parents and my brother are still there, did my undergrad there. Then I went to UBC, which is close to Vancouver and Coquitlam, where my grandparents were living at the time, and now back here to Saskatoon. So I uh, very much feel like I'm re returning back to uh, where our homeland was and is. And so what are some of the challenges you have encountered as an academic with work focused on Indigenous community? Um, some of the stress and challenges of living in both worlds, of trying to raise a family while you're doing your, your research as well? Yeah, yeah, I think there's two, two challenges in there. One is the, the, the academic world and being an Indigenous person and working with Indigenous communities and there's some different challenges there. I think the one that we're all kind of more acknowledging lately is the time it takes to develop relationships and, and community ties and to be doing research um, the right way, in a good way. And um, so as I said, I moved here and I didn't have the, the community ties, so I started with research with just general population to get going and then built ties and, and moved. It took me three or four years of being here before I was really ready to get going and doing that research and have the time to get set up the way that I really would like to be before I do research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it's really important to, to highlight just how much time is required to build and then ma maintain mm -hmm. uh, those relationships. Um, so if you could speak directly mm -hmm. to one Indigenous high school student who is thinking about a career as a researcher, uh, mm -hmm. what would you say? I think that there's some definitely some positives of this kind of r role. I get to direct where I go in my research and I get to work in the areas that I want to. Um, and make connections and relationships and, and, and do work that feels more um, valuable. I think there's, there's a lot of potential in the type of work that you can do that you could make change and, and support people to be um, whatever, you, whatever field you're going into uh, to be successful. Um, I like the variability that I get to do different things on different days. Sometimes I'm teaching, sometimes it's research. I, I like that kind of change. And then meeting a lot of different people in great conversations, great community environment. Um, my college is, is a great community to be in. Um, that was one of the reasons why this job was appealing. Um, I like the people that I work with and it's been a very community 
setting, the way that we're, we work together. Um, I, I have a, a big list of people that I tap to help me out with my research in, in terms of the research aspects in our college. So uh, there's a lot of people who, who help me. It's not just me. It's a lot of, and, and all of my students and research, and research assistants, of course, as well. Yeah. So it really is a, a group effort, a real it's community. A, there's a big community of people, yeah. 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 Well, this has been wonderful, Heather. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to visit today and just really enjoyed learning more about your research, a bit more about your personal story. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. So Kurt, if it's all right with you, I'll get you to show me some steps. I am 40 now, so I'm a little worried about pulling a muscle or a calf, so just go easy on me. Okay. Okay, uh, first I'll show you just the, the tap, I guess. I don't really know the names, but um, I'll just do the jigging, I guess. First, the first step, we do like this, one, two, and like this, tap, tap, and then your other one, two, and then, see, like that. And then repeatedly, just keep doing that. Uh, yeah, like that. The second one would be one, two, and then back, one, two, and then, yeah. Like this, one, two, and then keep doing that, one, two. Yeah. Like kind of do it fast, like one, two. Like this, like twice, yeah. Yeah, like that. You can do anything for a fancy step, kind of like similar. A lot of people have their own too, the way they jig faster, slower. But those are some, those are like the main ones people always do, what I just showed. Yeah. Like this. Jigging, it's a jig. the calf, but that's okay. Right on, that's you're okay. pretty good for you. Right on, thank you. <laughs> that was fun. Very tiring. Yeah.